is by constantly moving forward, changing the energy resources we're relying on, mm -hmm. uh, changing the technology that we use, moving. There's no technology you can sit on that will last forever. It's just not true. There is no such thing as renewable energy. Right. Uh, solar power is not renewable. You don't make solar panels out of sunlight. Mm -hmm. That's not an infinite source. It takes a real productive economy to produce these things. Right. Same thing for windmills. So in dealing with the current crisis we're in, the only way, the only way to seriously talk about dealing with this current crisis is to discuss what are the frontiers to which we need to move as a species. Right. If we can make that clear, then we'll be capable. Then you can create the margin of wealth that's necessary to, A, break even. Mm -hmm. to just be able to sustain ourselves at the level we need to sustain ourselves, but then B, to do what we really ought to do, which is to move ahead in an anti-entropic way. Yeah, because the real debts we have are not monetary debts, they're physical debts. Exactly. We actually have a debt to the physical universe. Exactly. And that's, that's, that's immediately apparent just looking at across the globe with the, the level of existence that most of the population of the planet is on. We actually have a, a, an outstanding physical debt, mm -hmm. and you're not going to you're not going to solve that with any amount of money printing. You need to make physical leaps and advances. Precisely. And again, the, the you know you're in a crisis when the the president of the United States says that he's going to cut cut out of the budget manned space flight. Right, as as an excess expense, which it's not. It is not an expense. What's an expense is the bailouts. Mm -hmm. That's a net physical expense on us. You've mm -hmm. got whole chunks of the economy that produce absolutely nothing physically, but which are, which are responsible for consuming the entirety of our, of our uh, economic activity, our monetary activity. Right. You know, the way it looks, we've done this before with LaRouche's triple curve. Right. That you end up with, between everything, the derivatives, the bailouts, all of this financial speculation, you get this skyrocketing value of, 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 your, of your financial instruments. Meanwhile, your actual physical productivity is collapsing mm -hmm. because the people, the activity, all of the attention that you would normally be spending on a real physical economy, you're instead spending on this useless crap. Right. And what you get is you get that that's a hyperinflationary blowout where your financial value just rapidly in a hyperbolically hi, hyperbolic increase exceeds your ability to produce physically. Right. The actual physical goods it's supposed to represent. Right. So the real discussion right now is what are the physical steps that we need to take to be able to produce the physical wealth on a scale we've never done before. Mm -hmm. That means looking at the physical frontiers. Right. And like you said, one example of it, a clear one, is comparing, comparing, look at what's the discussion of health care right now here on earth. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's ridiculous. You look at the idiocy that's coming up around Obamacare. And the whole idea, the premise of the entire discussion is that we need to save money. And so the question is, how are you going to reorganize your healthcare system to save the money? And so you get all this really freaky, freaky shit that has nothing to do with actual medicine or actual science. The idea of uh, this evidence-based medicine. Right. All these things have nothing to do with real medical progress. Contrast that to the kind of approach you would get with a manned space program. Mm -hmm. And a manned space program, you're taking head on you're taking on certain key problems that you would otherwise only run into passively here on Earth. And the ones what you've described, the, the, the fact that with, with astronauts, we'll take, we'll take one example here out of many. Because mm -hmm. really what you're talking about is recreating the entire environment that's required to keep a human being alive. If you can do that, then disease is a no-brainer. Right. The little things you run into here on Earth, the question of cancer, AIDS, all of these things that we're tackling as a special case here on Earth, if you know everything that goes into the creation and maintenance of a human individual, those things become just par for the course. You know, you'll end up knowing why viruses exist, not right. just that they do. So we'll take one example here, the, the loss of muscle tone and then the decay of uh, the uh, loss of bone density that you experience in astronauts. So yeah, right, like you mentioned, the initial idea was that we had seen, you would expect something like a loss in bone density right. from being in zero gravity because we know that uh, athletes have a higher bone density than the rest of the population right because of that you know that the simple the act of loading bone of using bone of bearing weight on bone 
has an effect of increase, the effect of increasing the density of the bone of the human individual. Mm -hmm. Now that by itself is already exciting to look at. Um, we'll give you a quick picture. Bone is different than what most people think bone is. Bone is not some kind of solid structure which you're built on top of. It's not some kind of like, it's not a, a building frame or something like that. Bone is a very active living tissue. It's alive. It's completely alive. Mm -hmm. It's fluid. It's in a constant flux, constantly being uh, taken apart and rebuilt at every moment. You've got the, within the bone, you've got all sorts of cells. I mean, there's a whole factory in there which you won't be able to discuss. This is where you get the production of your red blood cells, your white blood cells. Uh, numerous other types of stem cells are produced here which are capable of being diversified into other, other different uses mm -hmm. elsewhere in the body. Uh, but the two guys that are going to interest us now in this, so that gives you, bone is playing this huge role in maintaining the whole physiology of the, of the organism, right. in this case the human being. The two guys that interest, interest us are the guys who are responsible for building what we know as bone, the structure of it. These are the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. Mm -hmm. One set, the osteoblasts are responsible for laying down the, the, the calcium phosphate structures we have that co constitute our bones. The osteoclasts are responsible for taking it apart. Hmm. Now, in space, in the zero gravity, outside of the, the peculiar effects of the, of the loading and unloading, somehow you get a triggering of the, you get triggering of the takedown of the bone and you get a suppression of the, the, the signals that, would, that should indicate the bone should be built. Right. And on Earth, we do have a corollary for that. If you take a look at Earth-bound bound cancers, I forget, it's some 40 to 50 percent, some l large number, uh, half to the majority of cancers that human beings are capable of, of that human beings encounter are, occur in the pelvic region. Mm -hmm. So as a result, you've got a lot of a lot of evidence, a lot of experimental results which come from looking at the effects of radiation treatment on the bone in this pelvic region. Now one thing is the thinning of the bone that you get as a result of this radiation treatment looks very similar to the kind of thinning of the bone that you get in osteoporosis here on Earth, Right. but then also the kind of thinning that these, the astronauts encounter on their space travels. Mm -hmm. And you, So you know for a fact that, that, that the the radiative environment mm -hmm. has an effect on on the bone density. Right. Again, in a very peculiar way. It's not the way you would think. It's not simply the radiation destroying bone or something. Right. It's a triggering mechanism that, for some reason, in the case of the cancer patient, in the case of these cancer patients, as well as in the case of the astronauts, the osteoblasts are triggered to cease their bone production, and the osteoclasts are triggered to start dismantling the bone. Hmm. Uh, now, there's plenty of reason to think about that. If you take a look at the environment the astronauts are in, the, when people think of space, they usually think of black, empty space. Mm -hmm. Not the case. The space outside of our atmosphere, above the ozone layer, above the, the, uh, our ionosphere, outside of our, just within in the fringes of our magnetosphere, this space is actually more active than on Earth. The reason right. we can survive here is because you don't have the intense types of radiation from various sources. Right. Radiation coming from within the galaxy, being pumped into us from our sun, accelerated protons, nuclei of, uh, whole nuclei of atoms that are moving at such speeds that they're behaving more like rays from coming from the edges of our galaxy, mm -hmm. coming from within it. You've got this immense soup there that's actually blocked by the different levels of our atmosphere. It right. disappears in stages, which is something we'll discuss more in an upcoming uh, mm -hmm. report. But this is what the astronauts are in. You can anticipate that effects similar to the, the effects that you see with, uh, with cancer therapy here should occur there. Sure. Now obviously anything that's discovered now in space is going to have immediate spill over here and vice versa. Mm -hmm. The other thing which we'll have a chance to discuss some now, but then than in upcoming installments, is if you look at the electromagnetic environment within our atmosphere, you get a very peculiar structure. It's not the, because of the conductive ionosphere of the Earth and the conductive surface of both the Earth's continents and oceans, you get what's called a waveguide. 
-hmm. within which you get a very, very specific, very detailed resonance structure, which has a serious, serious effects on biological processes. This by is by effects. You mean what do you mean by effects? One of them is that uh, in a recent Art Sensorum report that we just put out, you'll find it on this website, Peter Martinson writes a paper about the ability to perceive the passage of time. Mm -hmm. And experiments that are done when you magnetically shield humans and other organisms, mm -hmm. they lose their ability to recognize the passage of time because, uh, and it, they regain it when you reintroduce radiation that has roughly the same frequencies as you get within the, that resonating cavity of the, of Between the Earth. Between the Earth and the, and the atmosphere. The yeah, surface in the ionosphere, right, exactly. Right. So there's a, another sense, though, which is outside of what people normally think of as their senses, which allows you to perceive the passage of time without any external cues. Um, the question for us becomes, what else is mediated by that process? Right. Well, I mean, the <coughs> this this is one of the things that um, Bruno Brandamarte, he right. he he had and done a number of number of studies. He had, and some other people done a number of studies that you. Like you said, the osteoplast and the osteoclast, it's not simply uh, shutting something down, but it's actually regulating them. Right. And you have a phenomenon where there's a, the, the perfect amount of radiation engineered by our atmosphere that's allowed for living processes to function the way living processes do. Mm -hmm. And you have, different, you have different wavelengths and different radiations that affect and regulate different living processes. Right. And it's... So it's it's not so much of a um, a brute force approach to to life, but there's a certain regulation, a certain engineering mm -hmm. that only becomes obvious once you leave the planet Earth. Exactly. You can only do some of these very answer some of these very fundamental questions once you leave Earth. Right. And one one of the virtues of looking back far in time is that we didn't always have the atmosphere that we did. We never we didn't have we didn't have the we didn't have the ozone layer a, as it exists today. We didn't have the ionosphere as it exists mm -hmm. today. Um, so going just going back, it, it's it's worth going back and looking at the the creation of uh, what we call planet Earth today. Right. What we know as planet Earth today. Now, b b and you and you recognize something funny that it it isn't uh, it isn't the the uh, evolution as, say, Charles Darwin <coughs> or any British anthropologist will, will insinuate that it is. That what, what's actually happening is you have this relationship between what we know as the abiotic and the biotic, mm -hmm. where you have conditions created or platforms created where something can happen that wasn't able to exist before. And one of the best examples of that is what Cody Jones and Michelle Fuchs went through in a video earlier on this website with the oxygen crisis. Right. Or we should just call it the oxygen platform. Exactly. I think. You know, where they, they, review, they review exactly what occurred to fundamentally change the, pl the face of the planet. Mm -hmm. And that, that was absolute, it, was, it was absolutely intentional, you could say. Right. And a number of different factors came into play to make... Uh, life on Earth, multicellular life on Earth possible. Right. So you could say the potential was there right. for it to happen. And so when the desire was definitely there for it to happen. Yeah, the intention existed. Yeah, the intention and the desire were there and therefore life and the abiotic organized themselves to bring something into being. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in a in a sort of irreversible way. And so, you know, an interesting just that just poses the question for here for life on Earth. You know, not why doesn't it work? Why don't why doesn't biology work out there, but why does it work here? Exactly. You know, and that, that becomes very instructive for us here on Earth in, in what we want to do to continue life on Earth or on other places, exactly. in, on other planets that we, w that we may create. But you have to answer some of these questions. Precisely. You know, going back to the action crisis is a, good, is a good place to start. And it gives an idea. Take a look at the, we can do a chart here of the, the history of, of oxygen on the earth. Mm -hmm. And as they described, as you saw it described in the discussion of Cody Jones and Michelle Fuchs mm -hmm. earlier on the site, uh, if you look at oxygen levels, I mean initially the creatures that exist on the planet in the, uh, the earlier period, what's called the Precambrian, mm -hmm. before you get the real explosion of multicellular life, uh, uh, for a good chunk of that time period, this is around two and a half billion years ago, before two and a half billion years ago, you have uh, an environment that 
of creatures which live largely in an anoxic environment, devoid of oxygen. Suddenly you get the increase of the oxygen levels on the planet, which are deadly to most organisms. But as a result of killing off a good chunk of the organisms, produces much of the, much of the mineral deposits you see on the planet. Mm -hmm. One is the banded iron formations as they covered. But then over half, if you take about the, the round four and a half thousand minerals that you have on the surface of the planet today, you know, more than half of those require an oxygenic environment in order to, hmm. to exist. So with that increase in oxygen, suddenly you get the sudden appearance of all these mineral forms on the planet. Right. Uh, that increases the oxygen levels of the planet to roughly about uh, around 6% of the entire at total atmosphere. It's not until much later, which is about fi 550 million years before the present, when you get a sudden spike in oxygen levels up to the current, around the current levels of about 21 or so percent of the, of the, of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. That's something that takes place on a planetary scale. Now, it's open, again, we, like we discussed earlier, the question of what exactly triggers this is important. Because as we right. know, all these changes are correlated to m events on a much larger scale, a much larger astronomical scale, and very likely cannot be accounted for. This currently can't be accounted for at all yet by processes that occur simply within the Earth or on the surface of the Earth. Uh, but connected to that spike, the spike in oxygen, you suddenly see the appearance of multicellular life. But then in a funny way, the reason it becomes clear to us is, you know, around that time period you start to see what are called trace fossils, mm -hmm. which these are things like tracks and the mud, things that are formed by organisms. But no organisms themselves, because most of what, what you're dealing with are not just single-celled organisms, but single-celled organisms that have no hard parts. Mm -hmm. They're simply cells, fluids, mostly water. Suddenly in the Cambrian, you get what's called the Cambrian explosion, which is something that upset uh, Darwin for reasons we've discussed elsewhere. But where suddenly all of these diverse creatures begin to develop hard skeletons. Mm -hmm. Now this is significant, as you've brought up before. If you take a look at the chart of the different types of creatures that exist, existed, you have very diverse groupings of organisms. You know, all these look entirely different. No common ancestor which is capable of producing a skeleton. Right. Suddenly, despite this, all of these creatures begin forming skeletal structures on themselves at, at once. At the same, roughly the same time. The same time. Independently. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. staggered somewhat. You can see the staggering of the introduction of, for the different groups. But all roughly in geological terms, all in the exact same time period. Mm -hmm. And again, without there being any kind of Darwinian relationship between, between the, the groups, it's not as though there was some granddaddy of all skeletons that right. diver diversified into the skeletons. Some process on the planetary scale determined it was time to do this. This is huge. Now this gives you an idea that there's something at work here besides just simple random mutation and natural selection. Right. We take that, move that forward. Suddenly you see that lasts as a roughly stable state for quite a period of time. Right. Until you get another diversification later on, which is called the Ordovician radiation. Now in the Ordovician radiation, you see a whole set slew of new creatures, new types of skeletons that are formed. And you see, if in the Cambrian you saw the formation of the major groups, the major phyla types of organisms. Right. In the Ordovician radiation, you see those diversify hmm. into the various major families that we know, and including possibly the appearance of, uh, of one phylum that wasn't there before, which hmm. is an interesting one of these certain type of colonial organisms, these bryozoans, which we'll, hmm. we'll be able to, we'll, we'll, we'll have a discussion on them later on. Mm -hmm. But in the Ordovician, you certainly see this huge Again, you know, it's worth comparing this when the Ordovician radiation occurs to what's happening with the oxygen levels in the planet to give you an idea that you've got a much right. transformation on a much larger scale. But suddenly you see the, uh, oh, and, and to compare this to the levels of volcanic activity. Hmm. Because you see connected to this suddenly huge tectonic changes, again, right. of the sort that are on this 62 and 140 million year cycle right. of, of, of biodiversity. Right. Lexical biodiversity. This you see around this period is when you begin to see skeletons first 
playing a major role, calcified skeletons and uh, the silica skeletons first playing a major role in sediment formation and the g making major geological changes on the planet. This is all happening in the oceans, in the Earth's oceans. This is all in the oceans. This right. is all underwater. Right. It's uh, for several more millions of years until a period a little bit later. The next periods in the Silurian and the Devonian is when you begin to see the expansion of, of uh, life on land. Mm -hmm. Now, in order for this to happen, something funny has to happen. All these skeletons that you see during the, the Cambrian and the Ordovician are like a skeletal crust. It's a mineral crust that's formed on the outside of these organisms. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, during the period, the Silurian and the Devonian, you see the development of organisms, fish, that have, it's as though you took that whole exoskeleton and you compress it so it contains nothing but the nervous system. Uh -huh. And you see this is connected to a process of cephalization. Suddenly you see a, an added emphasis on the formation of the heads as opposed to the head just being contained within the, the body. It becomes a distinct shape. And then the actual flesh of the organism begins to form on the outside of that skeleton which houses the central nervous system. Mm -hmm. You get the formation of an, of an endoskeleton as opposed to an exoskeleton. Now these, in these fish, and you get transitional models which contain fish which have a bony exterior and an interior. Right. But then ultimately you get the fish which have an entirely bony interior. That becomes the model for the organisms that make it onto land. Other things, the crabs, the, uh, the different arthropods that live in the ocean, crustaceans, right. can even to this day only make it part way onto land and off. They live on mostly on coastal areas, etc. Right. Uh, unless they get very, very small and become what we know as our, the various hexapods, uh, insects, and other things which are small enough to be on land and have an exoskeleton. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not going to have a crab the size of an elephant on land. Right. To get to elephant size, you need to develop these internal skeletons which are on the scale that we recognize mm -hmm. as, which are the type that we recognize as our own. Now, what, what goes into doing this? So now, what, what allowed this to happen when it happens? Two things that are connected to what you described is the, the, this oxygen catastrophe, mm -hmm. what Cody and uh, Michelle cover. With the formation of an oxygen atmosphere, particularly with this increase at 550 million years ago, you suddenly had a density of oxygen in the atmosphere that was thick enough that in interacting with the solar radiation, in interacting with the, the ultraviolet radiation produced by the sun, you could form what we know as ozone. Mm -hmm. You could split the, the oxygen and have it reform into, a, into another state of the same chemical, oxygen, right. but which is now capable of, in the course of so doing, absorbs the ultraviolet radiation, which would be destructive to most life on Earth, which would destroy most organic, would be destructive to genetic material. Right. That forms a shield where suddenly now the continents are as defended for these organisms as the ocean once was. Mm -hmm allowing them, the organisms to move onto land, preceded by plants, which have the effect of bringing water onto land right. in their bodies. You know, these things are 70% you know, or more water. It's as though you've got the ocean moving now onto land. In the form of plants. In the form of plants. Mm -hmm. And, and later in the form of animals, which right. are... Right. And then bring the water cycle, essentially, onto these continents. Exactly. Hmm. Which becomes something we'll discuss in an upcoming installment in discussing more about Nawapa's effect on the on the water cycle. Right. So then you've got the ability to shield now skeletons from the effect that we're looking at we're seeing with the astronauts. So now you've got that distinction we see with the astronauts between this intense radiation environment and then a more shielded environment on land. Mm -hmm. But then you also see now the the formation of the ionosphere as we know it. With every transformation of the of the atmosphere you get a different combination of ions that are produced at, under the influence of solar radiation. The gas ionizes itself mm -hmm. and becomes a conductive material. You separate the positive from the negative charges and you get something, a region of gas, which functions just like a conductor. Hmm. This ionized region, this con conducting region, combined with the conductive region of the oceans, which are hugely electrical, mm -hmm. and the continents are hugely conduct electrical. They, they conduct electricity, which is why you can use the ground to ground yourself. Right. Uh, these two together, and the current streaming through them, uh, through a process we'll discuss later involving thunderstorm formation and other things, form a resonating cavity, which has a very specific set of frequencies that are that are contained in it. 
Right. Why does this interest us for the bone? Right. This brings up what you discussed earlier with the work of, of Brandon Martin. Mm -hmm. Now this is a, uh, now Bruno Brandemarter's work, uh, it's known, he does research in looking there, it's known now that bone itself is a very electrical uh, phenomenon. If you, it's known that, that applying a current across, applying a current across bone fractures can speed up the formation of, right. of bone tissue. Initially it was thought that this was done simply on the basis of moving calcium ions back and forth. You're creating a potential there and it's encouraging the, the transport of calcium ions in the formation of bone. Right. But what Brandemarcher shows, you know, initially he looks at the work of a uh, earlier work of a researcher named Bassett, but then continues it himself, is that the bone, res bone is capable of responding to very specific electromagnetic frequencies. Uh, of a certain type, so low that he prefers to call them magnetoelectric right. rather than electromagnetic. Now these frequencies are the, well, these frequencies are capable of stimulating not just the, the mineral accumulation in bone, but he looks, he realizes they're actually stimulating the behavior of the tissue, the cells mm -hmm. within the bone. Right. And in fact, the application of different frequencies different waveforms of frequencies to the same tissue will have different effects right. on the formation of bone, but then also a wide range of other things, treatments for, he's found that you can use this to treat symptoms connected to diabetes, things connected to, um, uh, things, symptoms connected to AIDS, other kinds of physio physiological disorders that are connected to tissue itself right. are responsive to different changes in the electromagnetic environment. Right. Now what's interesting is the frequency range which he uses to achieve these biological effects is the same low frequency range that you see that's generated by life as a result of this interaction between the Earth and the ionosphere. Mm -hmm. So you're realizing that, that the development of these skeletal structures is something that happens on a planetary scale. Yes. Now this is just to provoke, we had the discussion earlier that you, know, you wonder now, now you can go back and ask yourself, what is it that would cause a sudden diversification of skeletons and all of these unrelated species? Mm -hmm. It's as though what's triggering them is some process outside of them, mm -hmm. but which is a unitary process, a one single idea. Right. We're starting to get an idea of where we could look to, to find this. Yeah, well, it's, it, it's also treating the earth as a as a certain laboratory right you see these things devel developing independent sort of popping up independent of what seemingly independent of one another independent of any direct genetic connection or any sort of you know kinetic one-to-one -one relationship mm -hmm. and you realize that there is a much there is a whole but it's much greater than what's happening on this continent or this or this planet mm -hmm. you have this this whole galactic process going on exactly and Therefore, your your planet Earth is no longer just your planet Earth. Therefore, your whatever your whatever interaction you're having with the planet Earth, you need to know that you're actually interacting with this whole other process, the mm -hmm. process of evolution through time, but also this 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 galactic processes and beyond, right. which we just haven't we haven't put put it together yet because we haven't spent enough time out there yet to figure it out. But we know we are interacting with these processes. Exactly, and you know that you don't know what life is until you're acting on that scale. That's right. That, and that's, that's the virtue of, that, those are the implications for medicine, mm -hmm. and that's, those, are the, that's, those are the implications for a human economy. Right. It's to be, to, and that's, that's the question of, what it, it, to us we call it a frontier, to, uh, as, as we're witnessing with the abiotic in the biosphere, and really with human history, and you look at it in the best way, that's just what we do. We move to these other states of existence, mm -hmm. and you, from there, from moving, from putting yourself through that, that, you know, putting yourself through that transition, you begin to learn a lot more about the the state of existence that you're you're currently in. Exactly. And as a matter of fact, you won't know about the current state of existence that you're you're in unless you are moving forward, unless you're walking forward. You're it has no forward. meaning unless it's part of a longer process. Right. There is no way to define 
to give the significance to anything in isolation of, of, of the process in which it's contained. Right, because nothing exists in isolation of a, exactly. of a larger process. And this gives you the idea, instead of, this is what uh, LaRouche has been stressing, Lynn's been stressing, is that instead of the idea of infrastructure, mm -hmm. instead of the idea that you're simply right. building rail or you're building water projects or you're building a communication grid or something like that, what you're really talking about are successive platforms you're talking about creating the conditions for further anti-entropic growth that didn't exist prior. Mm -hmm. This is what we see with the, uh, with the development around the oxygen crisis. Right. The ability to develop the kinds of multicellular life, which are much larger, and oxygen metabolism is much more active, much more efficient than, than, um, uh, than uh, different other types of metabolism, and things that existed prior. Mm -hmm. To do that, you need to create the oxygen environment at the same time, you're creating the ability for the internal skeletons that allow those complex multicellular creatures to move onto land. Right. You're creating the conditions where you're shielding them from the radiation that would otherwise kill them, all in one fell swoop. All of these are not infrastructure for life. Right. This is not so that life can reach some stable state. <laughs> this is you're creating the conditions for a next evolutionary transformation. Mm -hmm. This is the proper way to think about the the development of human infrastructure. Yeah, think about that, what it means for power generation, what we use as an energy, uh, a power source. I mean, think, just think about what that means. It's exciting because it, it, it implies a, a constant evolution in what we use as an energy source. Right. That will give us different capabilities to then improve other, what we refer to as infrastructure, which is really just creating different conditions, whether it's transportation, whether it's power, transportation, uh, city building, any of the any of this stuff, mm -hmm. that's that is the um, that's sort of the archetype is is moving to higher states of the of what we currently know exist. Right, which runs really right in the face of what the current administration seems to be uh, doing. With it's the exact opposite <laughs> of the yeah. of o Obama's policy. Mm -hmm. It's the exact opposite of imperial policy. Right, imperial policy is pushing for a steady state. Mm -hmm. You're pushing for trying to find an equilibrium where you have no growth. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing you get from the environmentalists. Why the environmentalist outlook is fundamentally fascist right. and fundamentally imperialist. It fundamentally believes in the subjugation of human beings to, to powers that are su supposed to be larger than they are. Mm -hmm. Whereas a real human economy says, that, look, the entire development of the biosphere has been through these series of, of, of anti-entropic discontinuous shifts that are only exist in order to make room for the next shift. Mm -hmm. The alternative would would have, and the biosphere would have resulted in a collapse. To do what the environmentalists are proposing right now, right. to try and find some sustainable energy source and sit on it forever. Mm -hmm. That you're going to find energy, you're going to find solar power, you're going to find wind power, you're just going to sit there, is entropic because solar panels, the production of solar panels, requires the consumption of resources. Right. What makes them different from nuclear power is that solar panels do not give you the return on your investment that you would get from nuclear power, and they don't point in any direction. Right. Whereas nuclear fission points towards nuclear fusion. Mm -hmm. Nuclear fusion represents a platform that allows you to do things you could never do otherwise. The ability to have the kind of, of one Earth gravity accelerated travel that would get us from Earth to Mars only exists within fusion power, because only fusion power has got the ratio of fuel to, to impulse. Right. Only that has the right specific impulse to move us at the velocity, the accelerations, the forces that are required to accelerate us such that you can create the, at least the gravitational environment we require. Mm -hmm. You know, not to mention creating the electromagnetic environment, which we're discussing here, to be able to move life off of Earth's biosphere and to create biospheres elsewhere in the, mm -hmm. in the solar system and beyond. It's, it's as if they wanted stay right here and stay in the womb. Exactly. Environmentalists and every, really everything that is represented by British policy, by imperial policy, is, it, because it's not just standing still, it's an attrition. Right. It's a lowering, it's a, deg it's a degradation of your current state. There is no, there is no equilibrium necessarily. But what they're, what they're proposing, what they're promoting, and what they currently have the world gripped by is a, is a, is a state of attrition. Right. That's what what's actually is gripping and determining a lot of the most of the processes happening today. Mm -hmm. And it's a willful. If you do not move forward, you will collapse. Mm -hmm. There is no stationary existence for the human species, and we should think of it happily. I mean, like you said, I like that you use the phrase "womb" to describe this. Mm -hmm. It's really it's significant. I mean, if you think about life here in the biosphere, 
the reason we're so shocked as we encounter new things, new diseases, uh, different problems, is because we are very much like a, a fetus in the womb. We're connected through an umbilical cord. Here on planet Earth. Here on Earth. Yeah. We're receiving resources. We're being fed. We have no idea what's required to maintain. Like the fetus has no idea what's required to maintain its own existence. Right. It's incapable of walking, incapable of using its arms. Uh, and you might initially think, some people might think that that's a pleasant position to be in. Mm -hmm. The rest of us who are more sane mm -hmm. are very happy that we were able to leave the womb and gain a, a right. certain measure of independence. Right. You know, we might have been upset in the first instant. We cried. We all cried. Mm -hmm. You know, the bright lights were smacked, et cetera. <laughs> that was a little, that may have been upsetting, but mm -hmm. I don't think any of us would trade existence, trade this, or what we have now for an existence in the womb. Right. But the situation now on a planetary scale is very similar. We are finally in the position where we need to ask, well, where did the ability for us to exist as cognitive beings come from? What, what, what structures facilitated that? What were the series of platforms that allowed for that? Right. How do we replicate those to allow for our actual passage into adulthood as a species, to mm -hmm. leave this planet and to move the biosphere in an improved form with us? Because we do. We improve the biosphere. Absolutely. Contrary to all the environmentalist propaganda, everything we've done acting on the biosphere when we're acting sane has increased its efficiency. Right. Beyond, we're, we're a part of that same evolutionary process we've been discussing. Right. Now we've got a chance to, to leave the womb. Other people like the, uh, you know, the empire, our president, et cetera, are, are intent on staying in the womb. Mm -hmm. Long past it was time for them to, them to come to term. Right. Now we can only imagine what kind of damage that would cause. We've right. continued our analogy here. <laughs> yeah, well I think that's, that's, that's the point is that we do, Im we do improve the biosphere. Right. That is, that is the, uh, that is our, that is our position. We do, Im the environmentalists don't, they do not improve it, they degrade it, but mm -hmm. we do improve it. And that, that is the, that is the mode human economics takes when it's, when it's principled, when it's guided by something. I mean, take the, the United States preamble in the Constitution. That, as a guiding mechanism, that is directly in line with this whole process, evolutionary process that we went through, right. as we've, we've mentioned before. You act on, a, you, ha you have principles in which to act on. And it's this interesting phenomenon where, uh, it's like the difference between, um, you know, nepotism or a, a, a monarchy mm -hmm. reigning you know, in different parts of a uh, parts of the world, versus having independent republics sprout up all over right. the place, that you have, you have, once once a principle is recognized, a principle of organization, political organization, economic organization is recognized, you then because it's a universal thing, all human beings can must partake in this evolutionary development, but it's got to be willful and, and our political and economic processes have to reflect that process. Mm -hmm. It's not really, it's not a choice. It's right. not one's opinion. It's not one's interpretation of it. You can't wake up one day and say, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to breathe this combination of oxygen and nitrogen. Right. Mm -hmm. You try it, see what happens. <laughs> I'm against that. <laughs> yeah. I'm I, a right winger. I'm a left winger. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm, I'm against oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I interpreted it differently, actually. Yes. <laughs> well, you don't really see what happens when you have that choice. Mm -hmm. Why would it be much different in the way we organize ourselves on a principled basis in terms of human economics? Precisely. It's not. And when we do take it as opinion, as you do take it as, as, as opinion or um, yeah, a clash of down party lines or some racial bias, look what happens. Look, what, look how the planet is organized today under that system of imperialism. Exactly. And, and there's, your, there's your answer. So what ha needs to happen now is to overwhelm that and move to a, a higher platform immediately. Because again, the biggest debts we have are not monetary debts. Mm -hmm. The biggest debts we have as a species are physical debts which are going to be, it'll be quite a joy actually to work ourselves out of those debts mm -hmm. because it will, it will immediately require a transformation not only of planet Earth but in our own thinking. Right. And that's, that's how the, that's how the, the thing works.